Okay, so welcome to this uh, Cream Brown Bag Seminar. Today we have uh, Cecile Magne who will present Does the timing of the final test in primary school affect educational outcomes of migrant children? So just as a reminder, the seminar is recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, uh, please um, switch off your camera when you are talking. And if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt Cecile in time. The floor is yours. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks for joining everyone as well in this uh, special setting. Today I'll be presenting uh, a research that uh, is joint work with Bart Holstein and Inge de Wolf. And um, we look at uh, the effects of a policy change on the educational outcomes of migrant children. Uh, let's see. So uh, up until now, the immigration share um, of students in uh, the Dutch population has been growing and it's up uh, at 25% at this point. Um, and it's very interesting because we know that education is a major channel for integration. So we asked ourselves the question, how should you design um, an educational system in such a way that these uh, students with an immigration background can thrive uh, as well? And what we want to do with this research is we want to evaluate the effects of a policy change on migrant children. And in the Netherlands, at the end of primary school, everybody takes a standardized test. So we want to check the effects on their test scores. And we also want to check the effect of the policy change on the, the teacher assessment that they receive. And the combination of these two that determines to which secondary education level they can go to afterwards. So the policy change that we uh, investigate in this research um, consists of several elements. So first of all, after the policy introduction, the exit test became compulsory. Um, beforehand, the schools could decide themselves which students they wanted to participate and which they kind of excluded from the test. After the policy introduction, the, the test now was held three months later. Um, and because of this shift in the timing of the test score, now the test was held after the students received uh, the assessment of their teacher. And this meant that, of course, teachers now had to give this assessment without knowing the, the final test score. So once they could observe the test score, they were allowed to adjust the assessments, but only upwards. Um, so we have Dutch administrative data of all primary school students in the Netherlands. And what we're going to use is a difference in differences method where we focus on the first generation non-Western migrants and we compare them to uh, the natives, the second generation uh, students and first generation Western migrants. And what we do as well is there were some concerns about the first year after the introduction of the policy change. Uh, because not all schools were adapted to the new reality yet. So people are always a bit concerned uh, about the data of that year. So as a robustness check, we also exclude this year uh, in our analysis. And what we find in the end is that the teacher assessments uh, were not affected after the policy change. But we do find that the test scores of these first generation non-Western migrants relatively increased uh, compared to natives and second generation students. And it looks like the teachers took this into account when they revised their assessments afterwards. So two uh, previous studies have already looked at this policy change, but they looked at a bit of a different things. So the first one by Svartadal, um, they looked at whether it mattered if teachers could observe the test score or not. So pre and post policy uh, to check if students change tracks in secondary education more often. And they found that but when teachers couldn't observe the test score, so after the policy change, that uh, students were more likely to change tracks. And Veron also studies the um, uh, setting after the policy change. So when teachers again give the assessment without knowing the test score, and she finds that teachers are then more likely to kind of give favorable assessments to girls and to students from high SES backgrounds. And what we do is we focus on migrants and we kind of take both the test score and the teaching assessment into account. And we want to see which of these changes that uh, were caused by the policy change drives the results that we find. 
So I'll give you a bit more information about the institutional background. Uh, we'll go more into detail about the data. I'll give you an overview of the policy change and the hypotheses that we derive uh, from all the changes. And of course, I'll present you all the results uh, later on. So in the Netherlands, you go to primary school for about eight years. And then when you have to switch to secondary school, the tracking already starts. So that's at a relatively early age, around 11 or 12 years old. And uh, secondary education consists of three main educational levels. Uh, and within those levels, there are eight different tracks. And this tracking, like I said before, is based on the school exit test score of students and the assessment that they receive from the teacher. So this is how it looks. Um, so everybody starts a primary school that takes eight years and after that they are tracked in uh, three main levels. So the lowest one are these theoretical and vocational preparatory uh, education systems. They take four years. The middle level is the secondary general education is five years and the highest one takes six years and that's the pre-university one. And you can already see indicated by the arrows um, that if, for example, you attended secondary general, you cannot immediately go to university so you first have to go to either university of applied sciences or do like an extra year in this pre-university uh, track and we know from previous research that especially children with migration backgrounds they are not very likely to change tracks upwards so whatever tracking happens at the beginning of secondary education kind of sets uh, their outcome for the end of their educational level with possible long-term uh, effects on the labor market so we have administrative data of uh, all the Dutch students from 2012 to till 2017. The policy change um, is from 2014 onwards. So we have two years uh, prior to the change and three years after the policy introduction. We know the exit test scores and these are standardized on a scale of 500 to 550. The teacher assessments are given on an ordinal scale from one to eight. And we have some background characteristics. So we know the country of origin of the child and also of their parents. And that way we can determine to which migration group uh, they belong. And we also know the year of the immigration and the birth year so that we can calculate their age at arrival. And what's nice with, of course, with all types of administrative data is that you, can, uh, that you don't have any self-selection into the groups and that you can identify really or like relatively smaller groups. So in our data, um, we identify native students as students for whom both parents are born in the Netherlands or are Dutch, which is the biggest chunk, of course, of the population. The second generation immigrants were born in the Netherlands themselves, but at least one of the parents was born abroad. And then we have first generation immigrants. Uh, they were born abroad as well as their parents, and we divide them up into Western origin and non-Western origin. And we focus on the last one, so the non-Western uh, first generation. Most of them are uh, refugee children. So on top of having uh, a language problem, they also most likely deal with traumas. So we think this is the group that kind of needs the most attention of educators uh, to kind of get on well in the educational system. And what we checked as well um, is that the number of migrants per country of origin uh, making up these different groups, that makeup doesn't uh, change over the years. So it's not that if we find a result that it is driven by, let's say, a very big inflow of, of uh, refugees from a specific country. That's not the case in this, in this research. Um, some descriptive statistics. So the first line gives you the mean test scores, and you can already see that native scored the highest, and these first-generation non-Western immigrants uh, score the lowest. The same for teacher assessments. And um, interesting as well is that the average age at, age at arrival is quite young. So it's around five years old for these first generation immigrants. And this is a, a, like a better overview of what exactly happened with this policy change. So before the policy change, students would take this exit test in February. And then a month later, the teacher would give their assessments. So they could observe the exit test. But after the introduction of the policy change, you see that the exit uh, test shifted to three months later, but the timing of the teacher assessment stayed the same, which basically meant that now teachers had to form this assessment without this uh, final test score. 
And once they could observe the test score in the end, they were allowed to kind of adjust the teacher assessment, but only upwards. So given the different changes uh, that make up the policy change, we formed some hypotheses that we want to test. And first of all, with this exit test now becoming compulsory, you would expect that beforehand uh, schools could kind of um, exclude the worst performing students. So they had kind of this motivation to not let them participate in the test because um, the Dutch Inspector of Education also um, kind of value schools based on their mean test score and their mean teacher assessments. Um, so of course schools had kind of this motivation to keep their test scores at a higher level. So they would exclude the worst performing students. But now after the policy change, they couldn't do that anymore. So we expect for all students that test scores would uh, go down. With this exit test now three months later, we do not really think anything will change um, for the native students or for the second generation students because they, they have been at Dutch primary school for the whole time. Um, but we talked with some educational specialists and they said it's possible that this, these three months might make a difference for the first generation immigrants because they pro probably have a higher uh, or like a steeper learning curve so they can use these three months to learn the Dutch language better. So if that would hold, then we would expect an increase in the test scores for these first generation migrants. And uh, third of all, because the exit test now shifted after the teacher assessment moment, the teachers have to uh, base their assessment on less information. And there has been previous work, for example, of workers and griefs, who show that teachers can be biased. So if they have less information that uh, they will structurally underassess or overassess uh, students with certain characteristics like their migration backgrounds. So if that would be the case, then we would expect the teacher assessments to go down for the migration students. On the other hand, you can also think in a way that um, this test that the students have to take might not really um, give the correct message about the true ability of the students because they have, for example, language problems. And so if teachers cannot observe this bias test score, that might, might work in their favor and therefore maybe the teachers give a higher assessment. So what do we find? First, a little bit descriptive results. So here you see a figure which gives the mean exit test scores of all the different groups. So in red, we have the natives. In green, it's the first generation Western. Blue is the second generation. And then in yellow, I hope you can see it, it's the first generation non-Western migrants. Um, and what we can already see a little bit from this figure is that the test scores for the first generation non-Western migrants, so the yellow ones, they increase more uh, compared to the natives and they also increase more uh, relative to the second generation. But compared to first generation Western uh, migrants, it's a little bit difficult to say because they both increase. And it looks like there is some common trends prior to the policy change. When we then turn to the teacher assessments, it kind of looks flatter for all the different migrant groups. Um, it looks like there's a common trend, but it also looks like not a lot is happening right after the policy change, with a little bit higher assessments in the last year of our observation period. But of course, we want to test this for real. Um, so what we would do is we do a difference in differences method and an event study to, uh, to check for a common trend. Uh, and this is the regression that we run. So the migrant is a dummy and it takes on a value of one if the child is a first generation non-Western migrant. And it takes on a value of zero if it's either a native, a second generation migrant or a first generation Western. And we run different analysis for these three different groups. And then, um, of course, we're interested in uh, the migrant uh, times the post policy coefficient. That will be your diff and diff outcome. And we also check for the common trend with the event study with the migrant times the year before the policy change. With, and we take 2013 as the baseline year. So there's only one other year left. When we then first look at uh, the comparison between these migrant students and the natives, we first of all check and we see that the event study holds. 
And interestingly, when we look at the effect of the policy change, we see that these first generation non-Western migrants uh, relatively score higher uh, compared to natives after the introduction of the policy change. And for teacher assessments, which are in the last two columns, uh, we do not really find a significant, significant effect. And so the first column is the test scores, the second column is the test scores, but then with controls include, included, and then the same holds for column three and four. What I do not show here, because it's going to be a lot of the same um, uh, uh, tables, is that we also perform the robustness check. So we do not include the year right after the policy change, which is 2014. But when we run that, we find uh, similar results. When we then turn to the comparison with the second generation stu uh, students, we also find that the event study holds, so there's a common trend prior to the policy change. And we also find an effect of the policy change. Uh, again, that we find that these first generation non-Western migrants relatively score higher on the test score compared to the second generation, as you can see in columns one and two. And we do not find significant effects for the teacher assessments. So it's quite similar to the natives, but the coefficient is a little bit smaller. And again, the robustness check holds as well for uh, these analysis. Lastly, we also compare the, the two types of first generation migrants. We see that the event study holds, but we do not find a significant uh, uh, effect of the policy change. Um, and we find the same results when we do not include uh, the year after the policy change. So when we turn back to the hypotheses that we had at the beginning, first of all, looking at this um, fact that now the worst students would be included in the test and we would expect that the test scores would go down, we cannot really confirm that because we do not see that for any of the groups the test scores go down. Um, but for the exit test, not taken three months later, because we find these positive effects uh, on the test scores of the first generation students compared to natives and second generation, this might be a, be a plausible mechanism um, that could explain why the test scores go up. And lastly, about, when we look at the teacher assessments, we do not really find any um, significant effects of the policy change. So all these stories about teacher bias, um, we do not really look into them any further. So we want to take a closer look at this three months later connected to this uh, having more time to learn the language mechanism. So what we expect is that these first generation immigrants have steeper learning curves and therefore benefit more from this extra time. Um, and in order to check if that's true, we have this hypothesis that the longer the stay in, uh, in the Netherlands is, the smaller the increase in the test score would be, because then they wouldn't need that extra time so much. And if that would be the case, then language might play a role. So what we do is we split this group of the migrants into two, uh, into two subgroups. So uh, in column one and two, you see the results of the group that has been in the Netherlands for less than four years. And we would expect for this group that they are still struggling with the language. Um, previous research shows that children need at least four or five years to learn a new language. So this is the group that really is still struggling um, and uh, trying to adapt. And then in the last two columns, you see that uh, these are the results for the children who have been in the Netherlands for a longer period of time. So we would expect that these three months extra wouldn't make such a big difference uh, on their language component. And we do the same analysis, right? So we do a diff and diff again, and we check for a common trend. And we see again that there is a common trend when we compare them to the natives. And when we turn to the different diff results, we see that the effects are mainly driven uh, by the migrants who have been in the Netherlands for less than four years. So in column one and two, we see also a significant effect in column four, but it's about half the effect size of uh, the ones in column one and two. So that's why I say it's mainly driven by the migrants who have been in the Netherlands for not such a long time. Um, 
And we also want to compare this group to the second generation because we found some uh, significant effects before. And so what we find here is that these results are all driven by the migrants who have been in the Netherlands for less than four years. Um, and this also holds when we do the robustness check. Um, so what does that mean, right? So we, we see after the change that students, that migrant students perform better on this test score. And of course, you would like to see that teachers take this into account with their revised teacher assessments in the end. Because of course, the combination of the test score and the revised teacher assessment determines to which secondary education level they, they go to. And this figure shows you uh, the mean difference between the original assessment and the revised assessment. So positive values mean that uh, the assessment was revised upwards. Um, and what we see is that um, for the three migrant groups, um, they were more likely to have a revision upwards um, compared to natives, but we see, do not really see significant differences between these three groups. That could also be due to the fact that um, these first generation groups are relatively small. You can also see that, they're, um, that the 95% confidence interval is pretty big for those groups. Um, so what we would expect to see is, first of all, of course, that they would have significantly higher revised teacher assessment compared to natives, and that's what we see. But we would also like to see that for the second generation immigrants, and we cannot really see that that's happening here. So it looks like somehow teachers are taking it into account because they give higher revised assessments, but maybe not to the full extent that you would like to. But we're still a bit um, thinking about how we can um, do this analysis a little bit better and that we can uh, give you a little bit more feeling whether the teachers do really a proper job or um, that they only go there halfway, let's say. Um, so what do we find? So we do not find any effects of the, on the teacher assessments, but we do find effects on the test score. So the first generation non-Western immigrants have a relative higher test score compared to natives and second generation immigrants after the policy change. And it looks like the teachers take this to a certain extent, take this into account when they revise uh, their assessments. And we propose that the, the kind of the driving mechanism behind these results is learning the Dutch language. And because we find that there's only a positive effect on test scores for both first generation immigrants groups, and that the results are mainly driven when we focus on the, the immigrants who have been in the Netherlands less than four years, for whom we know that they, they still struggle with learning the new language. Um, and what's interesting at this point is that they're thinking about um, introducing a new policy as well, where they change back to the old system. Um, so we have to think about how to formulate our conclusions in order to kind of help the policymakers in the Netherlands to, to uh, make a wise decision, because it kind of looks like the policy change didn't really have any negative effects for the natives and the second generations, but did have a positive effect for the migrants. Um, so maybe going back to the old system might not be so wise, but that's something that we have to, to think about again. Um, so that was the story. Short, but uh, I hope it was clear and I would like to um, hear your comments and your questions. Thank you, Cecile. Um, so we have a lot of time for questions. So if you have any comments, questions, uh, please feel free to ask them to Cecile. Sorry. So can I ask? So maybe maybe I missed that. But so the policy change, if I understood well, was not targeting on immigrants. Right? So what was uh, what was the background of the policy? What did the policy interview in the first place? Maybe I missed that. Can you repeat it? You kind of fell away halfway through your sentence. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Great. So, what was the intention uh, behind this policy? Like, um, so, so when they when when they came up with this policy, what what was the goal? It wasn't targeted for to immigrants, I guess, or uh, no, maybe so I the, missed. No, so the policy change wasn't targeted at a specific group of students, but the idea behind it was um, that they wanted to postpone a moment up until the students took the test to kind of keep them concentrated in class as long as possible. Because they had the feeling when students would take the test already in February, they would receive the teacher assessment in March, and then they still had the school year running up until the end of June. That kind of these last months in the school year felt like a joke because they already knew the, the secondary education level that they would go to. Um, and, and, and so th they felt like they had to kind of shift up that whole process so that students would keep uh, stay motivated at a later point in, uh, during the school year. That was the main idea behind the introduction of the policy change. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Cecil, a uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, I was wondering, um, would you have measures of socioeconomic status of these kids? Because if it's um, some sort of a learning curve, maybe you see some of this effect also for children that are disadvantaged otherwise, so you could compare to another control group, let's say, uh, disadvantaged um, Dutch kids that might also do better when the test is administered later in the year? Yeah, I don't have the, those uh, data right now, but I could link them to it. Um, that would be interesting to, to find some kind of, um, at least for the, for the mechanism analysis, to find uh, a comparison group. That's true. Go on, that up. And, and just another thought on this, um, maybe uh, there is also some interesting heterogeneity in terms of income uh, for the immigrant kids. So if you can find some sort of a socioeconomic gradient in these results, uh, also for immigrant kids, that would be very interesting. Because the question is a bit what can be done, right? It seems uh, certain kids are disadvantaged and they benefit from having more time. Uh, and maybe there are more markers in the data that can indicate which kids uh, these are and how they could be helped. Yeah, so we don't have a lot of um, information about the parents of these immigrants, um, which is a shame. And they, most of the time the information is only slowly starts to fill into the data when they have been in the Netherlands for, let's say, more than five years. But I'll have a look at it because it would be nice if we could kind of split it up even more and, and compare different subgroups. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Cecile. I have a question that's kind of similar to Alice's. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Good to see you back. Um, I wondered, it's, yeah, it's kind of related to this um, um, information on backgrounds of migrants and I wondered if, um, sorry, I've got a two-year-old in the background. Um, I, will, I will get it back in two seconds. Um, so my question was, if you knew anything about the country of origin and whether you could get um, whether you could get language information on um, how frequently, I actually suppose they're all learning Dutch. Um, I was kind of thinking whether you could get any information on the country of origin and how frequently foreign languages are spoken in that country. Um, or, so are these, are these kids all taught in Dutch or are they, are, is the teaching in English at all? It's all in Dutch. So maybe upon arrival, they get like a, some kind of special classes the first year. But after that, they have to enter kind of the regular primary school system. And then everything is just in Dutch. And they might have some extra Dutch classes after school, but um, okay. most of them just have to kind of get along. In which case, ignore my question. I was kind of thinking they get be taught partly in English and if kids had a background that was in English, that might be helpful. Yeah, no, but the, so it all happens in Dutch and the, the, the uh, test is also completely in Dutch. Okay. So we have, Good. we do have some kind of international primary schools in the Netherlands, um, but they are not included in this story. But yeah, then 
I do have information, I think, on those schools. So I could have a look at whether those students uh, kind of attending international schools perform better in the end. Yeah. That's an I'll yeah. Myself <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'll have a, I'll, I'll think about it. I'm not sure exactly how, how it's put in the data, but it's an interesting thought. Um, I have another uh, thought that uh, could be interesting. Uh, do you have any information on peer composition? So often the idea is that students learn better or maybe quicker if they are the only immigrant children uh, in the class versus maybe if they're larger groups. So you could distinguish between different types of class composition and uh, how quickly that catch up happens and if that matters. Yeah, so we do not have information on the class level, but we do have information on kind of the grade level. So we can calculate uh, the composition of, 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 let's say, the background of the students per grade level per school. And we know how many students uh, are per grade level. So if, let's say the average class size in the Netherlands is around 25. So if we see that um, there's 50 children uh, at a school at a certain grade level, we know that it consists of two classes, but we cannot really split up um, to which class they belong. But still, we could we could um, calculate some kind of percentage of of, of um, same background students, let's say, uh, attending the same grade. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, I think I did that a very long time ago, but somehow in the process that idea got lost and we ended up here, but I'll have a look at it again. Uh, so, so just a follow up question. So it seems like you're pooling all the test scores or is this like, so do you have test scores of different subjects and can you use that to identify some kind of mechanism as well? Because it seems uh, like if this is mainly language, then maybe Dutch would be, a good way to look at math might be less affected because math is a little bit more of a universal language or I don't know. Like. Yeah, so over the years, the, the, the content of the, of the test didn't change, um, but the two main components are indeed language and math. Um, and only from 2015 onwards can we observe the scores on the different um, subjects. So we could only do that for the last two years in our uh, observation uh, period, which is a little bit of a shame. Yeah, because yeah, then you can really use the diff and diff, right? If it only happened after the, after the policy. Um, no, but you might be able to see if they're really lagging behind in Dutch relative to math, just for like a comparison, because it seems, I'm not like you could, yeah, I'm not sure that would be super useful. Of course, it would be much nicer if you had it over the full span. Of the period. Yeah, and the, the problem is, or at least not really a problem, but the thing is that um, people have been complaining for years already that the, the math part of the language of the, the test um, has a lot of these story uh, calculations, mm. right? So you actually need a certain uh, level of the Dutch language to be able to do the math questions. So a part of the math questions, of course, is, is just one plus one is uh, and then you give the answer, but also a part of it is really reading a story, understanding the story, and then say, uh, I don't know, um, James has four apples less than, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting. We could have a look, of course, to the, to the differences in, in the different um, test subjects and then comparing them to let's say how long somebody has been in the Netherlands to get some kind of grasp of, of how fast they develop the, the language skills. Yeah, maybe something like that would work. That you can test, for example, mm -hmm. one year extra in the Netherlands equals to a higher uh, language subject score, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we for a subset of students who lived in a particular area in the Netherlands, I think we have the division of math and a language before the policy change, but I'm not really sure if that's a, like a representative sample to this. Uh, it might be nice to have at least a part of a story on that as well. Uh, another thing I think, so the teacher assessment, I guess, is on the same scale as the final test, right? 
Um, no, so the final test is, is ranging from 500 to 550 and the teacher assessment is, um, has like eight ordinal levels. Ah, uh, okay. And what they, what there, there exists this kind of system, but it's, it's, it's not an official system. So there is a system that puts um, ranges of the, the final test score into uh, teacher assessments. So let's say the, if you score 500 to 510, you get the, that belongs to the lowest teacher uh, assessment. And then that goes all the way up to the highest one. But it's very unclear if teachers know about this and whether they really use it. So in previous research, they have used the system to kind of put uh, test scores and, and teacher assessments on the same scale to really compare them. But I'm not really a big fan of it because, like I said, I'm not really sure if, if teachers think that way. Might be able to just use their position and distribution to say something about whether or not they're like reversing people back towards their actual position in the full distribution of skill when they get the teacher assessment. Sorry, the test score instead of the teacher assessment, right? So before they had a test and they then leaned to that. So you are, you are at the 50th percentile and then I'm going to give you that grade. Now you don't have that information anymore. So I'm going to go a little bit below what I think you are because I can only adjust what you upwards. And then how much do I adjust relative to your position in the distribution? So you might have like a censored distribution and then, I don't know. I was just thinking that going that way might be interesting in terms of seeing how much teachers actually use the test to adjust afterwards because yeah. that seems to be an interesting mechanism going on there. So I think, can I go back here? Um, so instead of this story here, then you, um, you could compare, instead of comparing the revised teacher assessment to the original teacher assessment, you compare the revised teacher assessment to the test score. Uh, yeah, something like that. I'm not completely sure how, you, how I do it, but something like, because in the end, it's a matter of how much weight teachers put on the uh, test relative to how much they put on their ability to judge the student, right? I guess. Yeah, yeah. And then I think Hedgin has a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you have a question from Hedgin, which uh, micro is not working. So shall I read it for you? So her question is, uh, can you link students to teachers? And can you use this policy to understand teacher bias to immigrant ch children? For instance, to teachers who are always more or less uh, lenient. So for instance, giving high evaluation to immigrant children respond differently than other teachers to this policy change. Yeah, so unfortunately, we do not have any information on the teacher. For some um, classes, it, it states in the data the name of the teacher, but that's really, I think, only for 3% of the total data. Um, so the only thing that we could do somehow is do a school fixed effects when we know that, there, that when there's only one um, class as in the final grade, then you then you really target, uh, then, then you kind of filter out the teacher effects, right? But it's going to be a small sample that we investigate in, in, in that case. Um, and we also do not know whether the same teacher teaches the last grade of the years. So it's quite common in the Netherlands that teachers, um, let's say, teach last the final grade for two years, and then they go back to sixth grade for two years, and then they do like seventh grade for another two years. Um, so yeah, it, it's a very interesting idea, but I think our data are just not, not good enough to, uh, to really investigate that properly, unfortunately. So it means uh, you will then be able to, uh, to see whether the same teacher assess the same student uh, several times. No, no, unfortunately not. I had another uh, question about um, potential class composition. One thing that could be interesting to check is also um, what are these students converging to in terms of their achievement? So uh, the idea being in a school where a lot of people go to um, secondary kind of academic track schools, um, uh, maybe there's a higher incentive or more a higher likelihood for these um, migrant kids to to catch up while uh, you know so kind of a school in almost like a school fixed effect or a class fixed effect um, 
and uh, maybe with more time there is more convergence to whatever is prevalent at the school. Just try to think back to my school um, and it was the case that very few people went to these academic track secondary schools um, and it was very certain families maybe with academic background themselves that would send or whose kids would make the threshold. And even for migrant kids, so there would be relatively few migrant kids, but probably you know, two or three in every class of 25. And it was also the kids with um, academic um, kind of background uh, that would make the threshold. And um, I can imagine that in schools with a lot of migrant, uh, with a lot of um, people making that threshold, there is a higher incentive to conform to the group. Yeah, so some kind of school benchmark that you would calculate and see if the higher performing schools also trigger students to kind of... Yeah, or peer effects or you yeah. could call it neighborhood effects, or, but uh, that there's just more encouraging uh, and more encouragement to go down certain tracks in school choice in certain areas or in certain schools. And that helps um, kind of being quicker on that learning curve or making more of these extra three months. Yeah. Yeah, there was this um, idea within the Netherlands that especially higher skilled parents were more likely to kind of push teachers and schools to revise the assessment of their children upwards. Um, and that would most likely be native students, but it's nice that, oh nice, it's, it's funny that we find that the, the teachers revise uh, migrant students more often. Uh, so the kind of this feeling of unfairness, at least when we look at these data, it doesn't really seem to, to hold so much. But yeah, we can definitely do some like more work on the peer composition because we do have data on that. So thank you for all these comments. Uh, any last questions? If not, then uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation, Cecile. And for all of you, I'll see you uh, next week for the next uh, Brown Black seminar. Have a nice week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.